Well, got a bit of a harder message today. Uh, Last week, we took a look at our great God and how such a great God is worthy of great praise. And this morning, I want to continue thinking about praising God greatly, specifically the ability to remain faithful and to praise God in the face of persecution, suffering, and sorrow. Allow me to share a missionary story with you. In the 1800s, there was a great revival in Wales, England. As a result of this, many missionaries went from England to northeast India to spread the gospel. Our story takes place in a region known as Assam. It was comprised of hundreds of tribes. The tribal communities were quite primitive and aggressive. The tribesmen were also called headhunters. Because of a social custom which required the male members of the community to collect as many heads as possible. A man's strength and his ability to protect his wife were assessed by the number that he could collect. Therefore, a youth of marriageable age would try and collect as many as possible and hang them on the walls of his house. The more heads a man had, the more eligible he was considered. It's into this hostile and aggressive community there came a group of Welsh missionaries spreading a message of love and peace and the hope of Jesus Christ. Naturally, they were not welcomed. One Welsh missionary finally succeeded in converting a man, his wife, and their two children. This man's faith proved contagious, and many villagers began to accept Christianity. The conversions to Christianity angered the village chief, and so he summoned all of the villagers to gather together. The chief then called the family who had first converted, and he demanded that they renounce their faith in public or face execution. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the man sung his reply, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Enraged at the refusal of the man, the chief ordered his archers to shoot the two children. As both boys lay on the ground, the chief asked, will you deny your faith? You've lost both your children. You will lose your wife as well. But the man replied again singing, though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back. The chief was beside himself with fury, and he ordered the archers to shoot the man's wife. In a moment, she joined her two children in death. Now he asked for the last time, I will give you one more opportunity to deny your faith and live. In the face of death, a man sung, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. He was then shot like the rest of his family. This story is one of great courage and also great faith. This man and his family were able to stand and say, no matter what you do, no matter what happens to us, we will serve God. And this attitude and response are part of praising God greatly. It's something that I want to examine this morning, so... Please turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to start reading 8 to 15, but we'll continue on later from there. For the sake of context, I want to review what's happened up to this point. So King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon besieged Jerusalem. Upon conquering Jerusalem, the king took a number of royal and noble young men to live and to serve in his court. Among these men were Daniel, like Daniel in the lion's den, and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These three men get their names changed by the king to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar built a very large gold statue, and then he commanded that when instruments are played, everyone must bow down and worship the golden image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." That brings us to verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. 
They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the wonderful gift of your word, that it's living and active. Lord, that your spirit works in our hearts and our minds, revealing the truth of your word and hiding it in our hearts and dividing between joint and marrow and going into the depths of who we are, exposing us, laying us bare before your word. What a gift, though it doesn't always feel good. And Lord, this morning as we spend time in your word, I ask in your mercy, Lord, by your grace, that you would preach the truth of your word to our hearts as your people. If there's anything in me that would be a distraction or a hindrance, God, just move me out of the way and let us behold who you are. That your word would captivate us and transform us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, for your faithfulness, that we can trust you to do this and more than we even imagine. Amen. What a picture we have in this story. The instruments have been played, and some Chaldeans go to the king to accuse the Jews. The ESV actually says, maliciously accuse. They start in verse 9 by appealing to the king with the declaration, O king, live forever. Then in verses 10 and 11, they remind the king of the decree that he made and what punishment he threatened. And after the men lay out this manipulative introduction, they tell the king about some Jews who've been given authority over the kingdom, and yet they don't even obey the king. They don't even worship the king's gods, and they don't bow down before his golden image. And the Chaldeans specifically named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when the king hears these things, he becomes outraged. He demands that these three young men be brought to him. He questions them and he tells them again that when they hear the sounding of instruments, they must bow down and worship the image. And if they don't, they'll be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar then questions them as to what God would be able to save them from his hands. The king knows that these three men are not bowing down to the golden image because of the God they worship. And the king's saying to them that they'll die and that their God won't be able to save them. This situation was the reality for the tribal family that we looked at earlier. And it's a reality for many believers around the world today. A situation where kings and governments demand that people turn from God and instead worship the rulers or the gods of the rulers. And these demands get followed by threats of torture, pain, suffering, and death. In Daniel chapter 3, we have three young men. Men who had been taken captive, removed from their families, friends, and homes, removed from the temple of their God. These men have already suffered. And so it would make sense to us if they were to say and do whatever it took to ease their suffering. In their 
current situation, you would think that these men would just ask the king for mercy and then simply bow down with the rest of the crowd when the music plays just for the sake of saving their lives. They could say in their heart it's not real. They just have to physically do the action. It'd be so simple, be so justifiable. How easy would it be for us to rationalize and to justify to ourselves that we should do whatever is necessary to survive or to thrive or to have comfort? But is that how these men respond? Or is their response more like that tribal family in India? Look with me at verses 16 to 18, and this is really our focus for this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We could spend multiple weeks going through this passage. It's one of my favorite passages. And there's a couple important things that we see of these men in their response. They were bold enough to respond to the king without appeasing him. They didn't think that the threat to their lives was something to be considered. They simply said, if this be so. They had already done, as we are instructed to do, count the cost. They cared more about honoring God than they did about the opinion of people. And they had complete confidence in the God that they serve. In verse 17, they said, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. In our lives and our culture, especially with some of the changes that we see happening in our country, these are important lessons that we need to learn. However, the main thing that I want to focus on this morning is what we see in the beginning of verse 18. But if not. The NIV says, but even if he does not. What a phenomenal declaration by these men. They tell their king that their God is completely able to save them from the fire, totally equipped to save them from the king's wrath and punishment. And as if that wasn't bold enough, they say that even if their God does not save them, they won't turn their back on him. They will not serve other gods. Now, this declaration has been a great encouragement and also a deep personal challenge to me for many years. Am I willing to serve, follow, and praise God in those even if moments? I think you know the moments I'm thinking of. Many of you hear them, here know them all too intimately the times of sickness where there seems to be no hope and you know that God could heal you. The times of crushing blows and occupation and finance when you know that God could remedy everything. The times where family strife is too much to bear. The times where you watch a loved one fading away and you know that God could rejuvenate them. The times where the government or rulers oppress the people and persecute the church. These times in life where you know that God is completely able to change and fix the situation, whatever it is, and you declare that you'll love him and praise him, even if he doesn't. We sang a song earlier called, Even If. I just want to go over a few of the lines again from that song. I know you're able And I know you can, save through the fire with your mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, give me the strength to be able to sing, it is well with my soul. 
I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an understanding of this. They placed their hope in God. They knew that he could save them and they were committed to follow him and honor him whether he saved them or not. And this attitude and declaration are not exclusive to these three men. We saw this response in the lives of the family in India singing, I have decided. And we see it in many other biblical stories as well. Paul is a great example of this on many occasions. One of which in Acts 16, we see an account of Paul and Silas being imprisoned. In verse 23, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, this is a terrible situation. And yet, Paul and Silas have an interesting response. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. These two men were beaten, imprisoned, and chained up. Yet they were praying and singing hymns to God. How can people have this kind of mentality? How do we see people from the Old Testament, New Testament, Christian history, and present day who can, in times of anguish, pain, and suffering, stand and say, even if I will praise you, even if I will serve you? More practically, how can we have an even-if response when facing the fiery trials of life? I have four points that I want us to examine this morning. And if we're able to understand and apply these four points, I think that we'll be able to stand and say, even if. But before we take a look at those points, I want to make something clear. You can think of this uh, like as a foundation for the points that I'm going to share. If we are going to have an even-if response, we need to know more than just the mechanics of how to make such a declaration. Like everything else of importance, it's a matter of the heart. We need to know the motivation behind those who stand and say, even if. We need to be ready and willing to give up all that could be lost. Everything around us must become as rubbish in comparison to Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. To Paul, nothing mattered more than knowing Christ. Nothing in this world was more important than his relationship with his Savior, not health or freedom or riches or power or fame. Nothing that this world offers amounted to anything more than garbage in comparison to knowing Christ. We need to love God for who he is and not for the things that we might receive. We need to love God for who he is and not for what he can provide. And if we don't truly love God above all else, then I don't think we'll ever be able to say even if. Because he doesn't hold that top priority place in our minds and hearts. If I love money, friends, family, freedom, comfort, health, more than I love God, then those things are idols. And so, it seems to be an idol problem if I can't stand and proclaim that even if God doesn't work in the situation, I will still honor, serve, and praise Him. My loss of those things is more important than my gaining of Christ. When my love for God is above all else, when God Himself is placed above everything and everyone else, I'll be able to stand with Paul and say, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ 
Jesus, my Lord. And so desiring to praise God greatly and knowing that we must love God with all of our hearts and above all else, let's take a look at these four brief points to help us declare even if. Number one, we proclaim that God is good and worthy of all praise. We proclaim that God is good and worthy of all praise. Psalm 135.3 says, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. And Psalm 145.3 that we examined last week says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. If we can understand that our situations don't change who God is, then we'll be able to declare that he's still good and worthy of all praise, no matter what's happening to us or around us. We praise God because of our gratitude and our love for him in salvation. We praise God because of who he is, even apart from us. Not because of any of the good things, the blessings that may happen to us, And the negative circumstances of our lives shouldn't impact how we love and praise God. He is not Santa Claus with whom we can be upset when we don't like the present. We have to know the attributes of God. Because if we have a correct understanding of God's unchanging, perfect character, then it will allow us to praise Him in the worst of times. Because no matter how bleak things get for me, no matter how challenging things get for me, he's still great and greatly to be praised. Number two, we understand that God uses our weakness to display his strength and power. We understand that God uses our weakness to display his strength and power. At times, God uses hardship to humble us, to cause us to depend on Him, and to allow His power to be displayed. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, we have this amazing example from Paul. He says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, why does he say that? Because God has said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. See, Paul learned that God supplies what's necessary, and more than that, God makes his power perfect in weakness. So Paul says that he can actually boast gladly in his weakness so that God's power may be perfected and displayed. And Paul goes on to say in verse 10, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Why? For the sake of Christ. Look at that list. Insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. This is no small or light thing that Paul's saying. He is talking about very real, very difficult situations. Significant, life-altering, throw you to the ground in tears as a broken mess situations calamities. It brings us to the third point. Our hope must be placed solely in God. In all things, our hope must be placed solely in God. In the context of of this message and our focus, we have two main areas in which we need to place our hope in God. The first is that we place our hope in God to save us from whatever illness, trouble, or persecution that we face. And the second is that our deepest and foundational hope in this life and in eternity is the work of Christ on our behalf, and that he will take us to be with himself in glory, as he said in John 14, 3. If we're placing our hope in wealth, relationships, insurances, retirement funds, whatever, etc., then our hope is grossly misplaced. If we're living for the weekend or living for retirement, our hope is grossly misplaced. Wealth will run out. 
People will fail. Time evaporates rapidly. Insurances will fall short. If we're placing our hope in the things that this world has to offer, then we will not be able to cultivate the ability to stand and proclaim even if. Because the things that our hope are in are eroding away, decaying and disappearing. And so our hope is that Christ has ultimately saved us. Our hope is for him to save us from the situation And if he chooses not to, we place our hope in the fact that God has a plan, that he's in control, which brings me to the fourth point. We trust that God is sovereign. We trust that God is sovereign. What does the word sovereign mean? It means possessing the highest authority, supreme in power, superior to all others, possessing supreme dominion as a sovereign ruler of the universe. Basically, when we say that God's sovereign, we're saying that the whole world was created by Him and for Him, and so He has authority over anything and everything. Psalm 135 and Psalm 115 both say, whatever the Lord pleases, He does. Now to pair with that, we also know by reading God's word that if we're saved, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. And God desires to give us good gifts, better gifts than our earthly fathers could ever give because he's a perfect father. And so we know that God desires good for us and that he has a plan for us. A hard thing for us to understand is that what God desires for us And what he has planned for us may be different from what we desire. In fact, it often seems different than our plans. Which should make sense because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. I am finite. I have limited understanding, limited vision, limited presence, limited wisdom. Limited is a really good word to describe me. But God is limitless. He knows all, sees all, can do all. He is all powerful with no beginning or end. You know, an example of this difficulty that we have is like when a believer that we love dies. We can become confused. We can get upset with God. We don't understand why he'd allow that to happen. However, if you're a Christian... What's the greatest good that could ever happen to you? It would be to join Christ in glory, to live eternally in the presence of God. If we can acknowledge and believe that God is sovereign, that he has a perfect plan for us, and that his wisdom far exceeds ours, then we can boldly face the trials of life, trusting God, to give us the grace that we require, trusting him to work in the situation in the way that is best. Speaking of God being sovereign and having perfect plans, let's return to Daniel chapter 3 and see how God worked in this situation. So the three young men have just given their response of even if. Starting in verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace." Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound 
walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. What an amazing God that we serve. The furnace is heated to seven times the normal temperature. In fact, it's so hot that the men who throw the three young men in there are killed. And then these three young men are standing in the furnace, completely unharmed, unbound, with a fourth man standing with them. Not only were they totally okay, but their hairs weren't singed, their clothes weren't burned, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Can our God do the impossible? Absolutely. The difficulty for us is that we are to serve Him regardless of what the outcome will be. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God chose to save them in a miraculous and powerful way. But that's not always the case. The tribal family that I first spoke of, they weren't spared. In both circumstances, the people involved chose to stand for God and to make the declaration, even if. God will have his glory and he'll work things out according to his purposes, even if we can't understand it. And you may say in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can see what God's purpose was, but what about that tribal family? They just died. Well, let me finish their story for you. The man, his wife, and his children all died. But with their deaths, a miracle took place. The chief who had ordered their deaths was moved by the faith of the man. He wondered, why should this man, his wife, and two children die for some man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be some supernatural power behind the family, and I too want that supernatural power. And so in a spontaneous confession of faith, he declared, I too belong to Jesus Christ. When the crowd heard this from the mouth of their chief, the whole village accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. In both of these stories, God had a plan for the people involved. None of them knew what was going to happen. They didn't know how their story would end. What they did know was that they were going to honor, serve, and praise God no matter what happened. Dear people, I don't know what you're going through today or what any of us will be going through in the future. I don't know the persecution that you may experience. I don't know the depths of despair that some of you may be feeling now. I don't know the health issues that you're facing or all the different battles that you're fighting. As you can tell, there's a lot I don't know. But God knows. He knows it all. And we don't serve a high priest who's unable to sympathize, to empathize with our weaknesses. God knows what we face. Jesus himself lived out an even-if response before he went to the cross. We have the story of Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives in Luke 22, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, our ultimate example, modeled this very kind of response for us. Take this cup from me, but if not, That's okay. Your will be done. And we know how that turned out for Jesus. Houston Baptist Church, I wonder, 
Will you leave this place this morning and be able to stand with Paul, with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, with Jesus, with the tribal man and his wife and their two children and say, I know that you're able to save me. I know that the sorrow, the hurt, and the pain would all go away if you just said the word. I know that the fire will not harm me if your protection is upon me. I know that the sickness would leave my body if you commanded it, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, give me the strength to be able to sing, it is well with my soul. Our God is great and greatly to be praised. He's faithful and wonderful. Will we be a church made up of people who are able to declare even if, no matter what comes our way? Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Lord, This life is hard sometimes. You know it. You see every tear. You hear every cry. You are not like idols of carved wood and stone. You are living and active. You're a perfect father who cares deeply for your children. Lord, we acknowledge this. We praise you for it. Truly, you are great. Teach us how to praise you greatly, how to lift up loud voices of praise and song, how to lay our lives down for you, how to live lives that are an offering to you. And Lord, this difficult stuff we're looking at in your word today, to be able to stand, no matter what comes, no matter what struggles or suffering or pain, God, this is not easy for our fickle, feeble hearts. It's easy to get mad when we read this, to defend ourselves, to even place blame on you. But Lord, you are perfect. Your wisdom is above ours. Lord, your greatness is unsearchable. So forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, this congregation, your people. Heal us. Restore us, God. Rejuvenate us. Breathe life into our dry and weary bones and raise up here in this place a mighty army for you. A people who would stand in the face of tyranny, of corrupt government, of hate, of persecution, of every attack and lie of the enemy, of every tactic of our flesh, of everything that would come against us in this world, Lord, let us stand boldly, stand watch, and stand firm as we declare that our God is good, that our God is able, that our God works miracles, and that He has perfect plans for us, that no matter what comes our way, we will keep our eyes on You, and that we'll praise you, that we'll serve you and honor and glorify you, Lord. Teach us, strengthen us, grow us, we pray, by your faithfulness and your grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask all this because of the precious sacrifice, the shed blood and broken body of our Savior that we'll get to remember and thank for soon as we take communion together. Oh God, you are good. Amen.